Okay, all we're starting to get into um, almost real material for the course. This course is like a, an overwhelming amount of setup and preparation and getting ready and what context is it that we're living in. Um, and then we can start some real material. And I think this week is when we are starting official material. But the way I've kind of set up this course is the, for the past two weeks, we've been learning about density functions. And so I wanna just start today off with like a Q and A. Does anybody have questions about density functions or can I help address some context of density functions better or yada, yada, yada density functions or statistics? So I'm just gonna open up the space for anybody to type into the chat or uh, say, um, you know, with actual audio, any questions you might have about material we have covered yet or how it plays into this world with regards to statistics. I had a quick question on a gamma distribution. Yeah, go for it. Um, is a valid gamma distribution uh, the time between like um, each basket made in like a basketball game? Sure, totally is. Okay. Gamma was... distrib yeah, that was a great example. I've never thought of that one, but that's perfect. Okay. I was just making sure because it's like the time is random, right? It's like we don't. Correct. We don't... All right. Yeah, that's all we really need for the gamma distribution is random times between events. And the events can be anything. In the world of um, insurance companies, there are, let's say, like health insurance companies, they're like times between patients getting sick. And, you know, patients get sick with different issues at different times. So it's even like, times between patients getting sick with disease A. Disease A has its own gamma distribution. Disease B has its own gamma distribution. Disease C has its own gamma distribution. And that's what those parameters are doing, those like shape and rate values that kind of shift the distribution around to say it's centered at a different place or wider at different spots. Um, so all of these different examples, including basketball, would have like different uh, gamma distributions. Each kind of scenario would have a new distribution. It's crazy to think that there's actually so many of these distributions. You almost want to think of them as families of distributions. And the word gamma is defining the family because it can look at times between any crazy events you want to, you want to define. Good first question. Um, I imagine my answer both cleared that up and made it just as confusing to think that there's families of distributions. Any other questions that I can um, give answers to and then make more confusing? All right, you all want me to start asking questions of you all? Uh, I got a question to piggyback off that one. Yeah, go for it, please. Uh, how do you know if like the underlying like uh, thing is random? Like, uh, what if it like follows a pattern or something? And you're trying to like um, model it using a gamma distribution. Okay, so here's a crazy idea for you. Probability is largely abstract and made up. Okay, how does that answer your question? That answers your question as we don't actually care if it's truly random or not as long as treating it as random is good enough, then it will be fine. And the tricky part there is you have to answer good enough. Like, is it good enough? So consider a simpler example of a coin flip. Coins are not actually random when you flip them. There is some underlying physics going on. And if we could, you know, okay, so here's me, pretending I'm flipping a coin because I don't actually have a coin in front of me and my kid's asleep, so I wouldn't flip one right now anyway. Uh, if, if I had a coin here balanced on my finger and I flipped it, 
exactly the same way with exactly the same amount of force and the air resistant we knew perfectly and the environmental conditions we could set up exactly and the height from my finger to the table that it's gonna fall on was all known exactly, we could predict, as long as we knew all the conditions perfectly, we could predict how that coin was gonna flip, how high in the air it would go, how many rotations it would take, and then which side, which face of the coin would show up. But we don't want to go through all of that. All of that is annoying and tedious and takes way too much math. And I don't know any physics myself. So we treat coin flipping as random. And then often, if you had a coin in front of you and you were to flip it like a hundred times before you got bored, treating coin flipping as random is good enough for our purposes of saying, well, there's like a 50-50 shot of which side the coin's gonna show up on. So in the case of a coin, it's really easy to imagine, yeah, treating it as random is good enough. Your question, and I'm sorry, I didn't see who asked it, but uh, the question asked was, can we treat other things that aren't necessarily random as random? And the answer is, yeah, you can treat whatever you want as random, as long as there's like some degree of unknown to it, then treating it as random is probably going to be good enough. But once you get into the world of like applied statistics, people are very particular about what good enough means. Like if you're treating the stock market as random, which a lot of people do, but your model can't predict the stock market well, then you're invariably gonna lose a lot of money by making bad predictions. And so what I mean when I say, is it good enough to treat it as random is if you're making good predictions by treating it as random, then it's excellent. If you're making bad predictions by treating it as random, then maybe treating it as random is wrong, or maybe you've modeled it wrong. So my hope here was to answer your question. Yeah, you can basically treat anything you want as random, whether it is or isn't. Yeah, right. People are losing money on Tesla today. <laughs> you can treat you, yeah. anything you want as random, whether it is or isn't. The question is, by treating it as random, are you going to get good predictions? And if you can get good predictions out of it, then treat it as random. Excellent first two questions. How about we go like three more minutes of questions that people might have? And y'all are asking um, kind of context questions, which, which is excellent. If we don't get another question in a minute, I think I'm gonna ask you detail questions but I'll um, pause for a little bit. Yeah, go for it. I had one other question for the gamma distribution. Well, if you get the average, uh -huh. can you, the average of the gamma distribution, would that be the, like, the, di the what's the word? The average time in between each event then? Correct. That is what the average is on a gamma distribution, is the oh, average yeah. time between events. So if you go back to basketball, yeah. sometimes... Uh, the time between made shots in basketball is really small. And sometimes it's really long. Yeah. And sometimes it's everything in between because it's totally random, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you took all the times of uh, all the times in between made shots and you added them all up and divided by however many there are, you would get an average time in between made shots. And it turns out what that calculation is doing is approximating a um, property defined on the distribution itself. And that's actually what we're working our way towards in the world of statistics. This week and next week is all gonna be about probability, but then the week after that is going to be about means, what you all think of as a mean, and I'm going to define as an expected value. But uh, it's the, that exact idea about average times in between uh, events. At least that's what it is for gamma distributions. Okay. Nice. Thanks. Okay. How about one more and then we'll move on. Sure, Edward, I have a question. Oh, okay, good, let's hear it. Uh, the question is, are we all okay with the difference between density functions defined on countable 
spaces, sample spaces, and density functions defined on uncountable spaces. Was that like an okay idea that has been sinking in? It essentially comes down to whether I draw the picture with dots or a smooth line. And correct, countable equals sum, uncountable equals integral. That is um, a fact we're gonna continue to use time and time again. So I'm just making sure that everybody's got this idea down. I appreciate the comments in the chat. It sounds like this idea wasn't too bad and I'm making more of it than I should. Okay, then here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go X, done with Q&A. So we're gonna move on to a definition of probability as a function. This is crazy. You probably all never thought of probability as a function, but it is. It's a fairly simple function, even though it's a little intimidating at first. I think once we go through some examples, it's gonna be not too bad. These two topics here, discrete first continuous distributions, it sounds like we already kind of have a good idea of that, but I'm just gonna put new words to it. I'm gonna highlight probability as area under a density function here. And then we're gonna go into um, probability from a discrete uniform distribution, and that's gonna carry us through the rest of the week. So um, let's dive in and it'll start with probability have, as a function. I have a totally that a question? Unrelated, kind of unrelated, somewhat unrelated comment, which is um, I found this podcast uh, recently, uh, which has been around for a while, Radio Lab, and they do. Oh, yeah, uh, I love Radio Lab. Yeah, they do an episode on stoichest stoichesticity. Stochasticity. Yeah. Stochasticity. I can never pronounce the word right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the probability, randomness, and probability everything uh, was a really good episode. So if I, I struggle Excellent. with like conceptualizing stuff and being like, is random supposed to have a pattern and stuff like that? So it was a really, really good podcast to listen to for me. So I, I Excellent. Always have, <laughs> always appreciate shout outs for Radio Lab. Radio Lab is really good. Uh, Annie, what's the guy's name? Jad Applebaum? Something like that. Oh, God, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, I think, I think this is the guy's name, Jad something. Uh, he's a totally cool guy. He's kind of down to earth, but not in ways you'd expect. He came to Chico back in the day when people would come to Chico to give different talks and hold events. Uh, he came to Chico to give um, like... Uh, uh, an, an interview of sorts. He was at Laxon Auditorium and people could ask, ask him basically any questions they wanted after his presentation. It was, it was pretty cool. Okay, probability for us is going to be defined in a radio lab event with the link in the chat and also as a function from the sample space to the interval of real numbers from zero to one. So probability is going to be this math BB capital P. It's going to be a function that takes us from elements, uh, sets of the sample space to the real numbers from zero to one. Okay, the craziest thing about this is probability is a function. Specifically, probability is a set function. That is, it is, that means, let's say that means, so we don't have, it's a, function that takes sets as arguments. And that's probably the craziest part about probability. Once we get over the fact that it acts on sets instead of numbers, we'll kind of get over this, uh, over a lot of hurdles for the world of probability. Okay, so probability, here it is written out in LaTeX, is a function that goes from sets 
in the sample space to the interval of real numbers 0 to 1 inclusive on both ends. And probability is a set function, so it acts on sets. OK. They say there's three axioms of probability, but what they mean is probability is a set function that follows the following um, conditions. The probability of the entire sample space is equal to one. That puts an upper bound on probability. That essentially says we can have no probabilities greater than one. Probabilities greater than, strictly greater than one, do not exist. That's what this one says. Let's write that out. Probabilities are bounded above Axioms are indeed like rules. Axioms are indeed like rules. Axioms are like rules that if they're not followed, then you have broken the definition of probability. Axioms are like rules such that if they're not followed, then you've broken the definition. So uh, similar to how we had some rules defined for density functions. OK, so that one's not bad. The first one is probability is bounded above by 1. That uh, makes sense, right? We all imagine probability should be at most 1. OK, the probability is bounded below by 0 for any subset of the sample space. So that is, if you have a set A living in the sample space, then that thing has at least zero probability. Could be more. But it can't be more than one. OK? Three. This one is the trickiest of them. So we will spend the most time on it. And it goes like this. The probability of a countable union of sets is my notation down here too terrible. Let me see if I can write that a little neater. The probability of a countable union of sets is equal to the sum of the probabilities So long as a i intersect a j is equal to the empty set for i not equal to j. We'll call this pairwise disjoint. And I will draw out pairwise disjoint in a picture because the first time you see all of this going on, it doesn't necessarily make sense. OK, so here is the last one. So let's draw, as I like to do, my sample spaces as a box. And then I'm going to draw some vertical lines in this box that are going to create my sets A, N. Now, I can't draw a countable number of sets. So you all are just going to have to make believe. So this piece here, the intersection between any two sets, a, i, and a, j, so long as they're different sets, is equal to the empty set. 
Notice what my picture is doing here. By drawing in these bars, I am saying there is no overlap between any of these sets. There is no overlap between any of these sets. That's exactly what pairwise disjoint means. Any intersection between any two pairwise, any two sets that are not the same set is equal to the in, uh, empty set. The intersection between any two different sets is the empty set. The intersection between any two different sets is the empty set. And that's exactly what this picture is here trying to convey. No set overlaps with another set. They are all, in some sense, separate. Are we still so using, you, are we yeah, still using a, a sub n as a subset of s, the sample space here? Yes. OK, thank you. Yep. Yeah, so even if it's not like a circle within this, the box, the sample space, here a1 is still just a subset of s. I just haven't drawn it as a circle. Yeah, we are still assuming that each a n, each set here, is a subset of the sample space. We are still assuming each a n is a subset of the sample space. OK, so what this third axiom is saying is that if you want the probability of the union of these pairwise disjoint sets, then all you have to do is add up the probabilities of each set one at a time. I think this is the best way I can say this in English. So I'll say it again a few more times just so we can all catch it. If you want the probability of a bunch of pairwise disjoint sets. If you want the probability of the union of a bunch of pairwise disjoint sets, then all you have to do is add up the probability of each set. OK, let me say it one more time, and then I will read what I think is the uh, perfect example of this in the chat. If you want the probability of the union of a bunch of pairwise disjoint sets, if you want the probability of a union of a bunch of sets that don't overlap, then all you have to do is calculate the probability of each of those sets in the union and add them all up. OK, in the chat, it says, would an example of the sample space be a die and A be a number on the die? So a n would be a number on the die. And so a1 would be the set that consists. Let's just do this example, because why not? It's not the example I had in mind, but it's a good example. Give me just a second. I want to write that out better. Is this notation OK? Let the set a subscript i be equal to the set of the one integer i. It's a little annoying to use the index in the set itself, but it works out well in this case.
think this was the example that was asked for in the chat. An example of axiom three is let the sample space consist of six pairwise disjoint sets, A1 through A6. If the sample space just consists of the integers, one through six, and each AI is a set of just a single integer for one through six, then we could indeed calculate the probability of the union of the AIs as the sum of the probability of the AIs. So in this case, it would essentially just be like adding up one sixth six times. Now, if you want to take this example and make it your own, you could take a union over any subset of the AIs. Your union does not have to go from I equals one to six. Your union could be just the even numbers. Your union could be just the odd numbers. If you wanted to make this example your own, you could take a union over a different set of the AIs. You could take the union just over the numbers, uh, the sets with elements less than or equal to three. You could take a union over the odd numbers and also six. <laughs> Does that do okay for a quick example of axiom three? How does one create the sum symbol in LaTeX? Oh, great question. Slash sum underscore curly brace i equals one curly brace caret that's shift six and then the number six. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any follow-up questions on this quick impromptu example that came from a question in the chat, which was excellent. Thank you. Okay, then I'm gonna move on. So my example was a little bit different in mind. I wasn't going to highlight just the third axiom. So I'm going to differentiate my example as example of a probability function. So I'm just going to set up that I want to let A be a subset of the sample space or whatever that sample space is, an example of a probability function would calculate probability by this fraction. That is the cardinality of the argument, A. So you just count how many elements are in the set A, and you divide it by the number of elements in the sample space. And that turns out to be a probability function because the probability of the sample space is just the number of elements in the sample space over the number of elements in the sample space. Oh, great. That's one, just like we wanted. Two, the probability of any set A is greater than or equal to zero because, and here's notation you probably don't like, but it works. The cardinality function, where this dot is just to mean that is the placeholder for the argument of the function, this cardinality function, named by its symbol, takes you from the sample space to the natural numbers. And the natural numbers are at smallest zero. So indeed, 
the probability of any set A is greater than or equal to zero, since this numerator here can at smallest be zero. Okay, three, we need the probability of a union of the a n to be equal to the sum of the probabilities. But look, this is just the cardinality of the union. By assumption, the a n's do not overlap. They are pairwise disjoint. So let's take the cardinality as a fraction in the denominator out. We'll multiply that by the sum of the ANs. Is everybody okay with this step right here? The cardinality of the union of a bunch of sets is really just the sum of the elements in all those sets because these sets do not overlap. Does everybody see that? If you take the union of sets that don't overlap and you count how many elements are in that union, well, the sets don't overlap. So you can just count how many elements are in each set and then add them up. Okay, I'm gonna bring this S back into the sum. I just took it out so that we could see the add up all of the elements in each set on its own. But when you write it out like that, you really just have the sum of the probabilities of the a ends. It's at this point that I feel like all of you uh, don't believe that my examples are examples. And instead, do you think my examples are, are like new stuff? So look, we just gave an example of a probability function. The specific probability function that is defined here is take the number of elements in the argument and divide it by the number of elements in the sample space. And then we just justify the three axioms of probability hold for this function. The three axioms of probability hold for this example. So this is a valid probability function. Okay, silence this long means we either don't get something or we're just unhappy about it. So I'm gonna pause for a question. Can you explain the end of the second part with the cardinality? The end of it, so like this equation? Uh, sorry, the number two. This equation? Oh, here? No, like up, up yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so for the second axiom of probability, we need the probability of some set to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so what I'm doing is saying, uh, we're not looking at silly cases where the sample space is zero, because that's silly and we're just not gonna discuss it. So we're gonna assume the sample space has elements in it. So the denominator is always positive. So really what we need to focus on is the numerator. And so I'm reminding you that the cardinality, which is um, the function denoted by two pipes surrounding some argument, which I'm representing with dot. 
the cardinality function takes you from the sample space, well, sets in the sample space, to the natural numbers. If you're counting how many elements there are in a set, you're going to end up with a natural number. And if you end up with a natural number by counting the number elements in a set A, then at smallest, this can be zero. So if the numerator is zero and the denominator is positive, we indeed have always zero or greater numbers from our example function for probability. Since the cardinality of the empty set is one, is that why we can always have S in the denominator? The cardinality of the empty set is zero. Hmm. So but then, we're just assuming that the sample space has numbers in it. Because if you have okay. an example with a sample space that's empty, well, then probability doesn't exist. So that would be like saying the way you're thinking of it, I think that was Christian, the way you're thinking of it is the probability defined over a sample space that has no elements is asking like, what's the probability of an event that can never happen? Well, you can't really say what the probability of an event that never happens is because the event never happens. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great, thanks. So we're going to assume the sample space has stuff in it. And if it's got stuff in it, the denominator is always positive. The numerator is always positive. And at smallest, the numerator can be zero. So in our example, this has to be greater than or equal to zero. And it all comes down to the properties of cardinality. Cardinality is just counting the number of elements. And you can never have a negative number of elements. So should, we have a, should we have a um, condition then in our statements that says cardinality of s not equal to zero just to be explicit? Sure. OK. Other follow-up questions? OK, so if you go to our syllabus and you find the first textbook that I recommend, you'll get this web page. And in chapter one, section 1.4. This is like where we are jumping into the world of probability. And you can see their example, slightly different notation, but I imagine you all can get over that. This is where they start probability. It's like the most common example. But I have organized this course to be a little bit different because I don't think just presenting this example helps you understand more difficult examples. So if you want a reasonable resource on this first example, which is gonna carry us through this week of material, then I recommend you go to section 1.4 of the first textbook I list in the syllabus. If you want a reasonable resource of the material that we're going to cover this week, I recommend the first textbook in our syllabus 
and section 1.4. Okay, sounds good. So as I was just saying, I try to organize the material of this course so that it makes a little bit more sense when you see examples later on. So at this point, I'm going to take us on a slight detour in an effort to help us see the broader context of statistics and the example of probability that we just described and we're gonna use all week long. So the slight detour is in reminding us the difference of continuous versus discrete distributions. Statisticians deal with density functions defined on Countable, which includes finite. And uncountable spaces. Distributions defined on countable spaces are called discrete. And distributions defined on uncountable spaces are called continuous. So those are just two quick definitions I'd like you to contribute to your course notes. I feel we are at a good time to specify those definitions because we've seen examples of each of these last in last week's videos. And we're getting a better understanding of countable and uncountable and how it shows up in probability. At least that's what this week is going to bring us. Countable, here's a question I just got in the chat. Countable does not have to consist of only integers, though it commonly does. I was just about so, to ask a question about that, Professor. Is there ever a situation where we have to deal with negative prob probabilities? So you can't have negative probabilities because okay. probability has to be bounded below by zero as our second axiom of probability. <laughs> but maybe you're asking a slightly different question. Can you have probability defined on negative numbers? Mm -hmm. And you sure can. You could have a space S defined on negative 1.5, negative 3.2, and negative 7.46. So this is like saying your process, whatever the process is, only takes on these three values. Now, some things I'm trying to highlight here is you can have a process in the real world that takes on negative numbers. I don't have an example in mind, but I'm sure the world of physics measures things that only takes on negative numbers. And you can assign probabilities to sets within those sample spaces. So I have a slight follow-up question then. If we have a negative 1.5 allowable value in our set and we have a positive 1.5 allowable value in our set, do we treat those separately then? Correct. Okay, thank you. Nice, good follow-up. So this is like saying your process of interest could take on negative numbers and only takes on negative numbers and only takes on these negative numbers, 
But the other point to highlight is notice this is a finite set that does not consist of integers. This is still a countable set that does not consist of integers, which is totally reasonable as far as sets go. But you know, this is a made up example on the spot. I don't have a real life scenario where this might happen. Okay, there's some good questions on that. I appreciate it. I'm gonna move on. And if you didn't catch all of the written words on that page, then I'm asking you to come back to the video so I can try to get my last, my last bits in in the last four minutes of class here. So the next slide is going to be probability does not equal density. Instead, probability is area under a density function. And the reason you can't have probability as a density shows up on continuous, that is density functions defined on countable spaces. The reason you can't have probability as equal to density is because we want, we could ask about the area under the density function at the point A. Now the density exists at the point A, it's just F of A. But with probability as area under a density function, how much area is at the point A? Zero. Zero. Nice. Nice. Good. Got it in the chat and in audio. I appreciate that. Indeed, there is no probability at the point A, but density exists. Okay, so I'm going to continue to stress this point. Probability is area under a density function. So your all's next question, I know it to be, is, well, what about that example you just gave us about the cardinality of A over the cardinality of the sample space? How does that equate to area under a function? So, I'm going to remind us that probability from a discrete uniform distribution works like this. OK, I see the time now, so I'm going to draw the picture. And then I'll let you all run. Probability over a set A is the expectation of the indicator function on the set A, which is the sum of X in the sample space, the indicator function on the set A times the density. But if A is just two, four, and six, then essentially all we're saying is add up the density function when A is valid. Okay, it's 1051. I'm trying to cram too much into the last minute. Let's end it here and I'll pick up this next time or maybe I'll make a video of this really quick and post it on Wednesday. Uh, so I'm gonna post videos today for us to watch um, for the rest of the week. Um, please and thanks. 
Okay, that's the end of today. I'll stop trying to rush and cram everything in and I'll let you all run and be free. Thank you, Edward. Yep, Professor. Have a good one. Have a good day. Yeah, you too.